Good morning, dear ladies. Today we are going to discuss the last uh, poet of the second generation of the Romantic poets. He is Lord Byron. His full name is George Gordon, Lord Byron. Uh, he is one of the second generation of the Romantics. He is the largest. He is uh, one of the most representative of the uh, spirit of rebellion among other Romantic poets. Uh, we know that the uh, Romanticism, I mean the Romanticism as a movement, uh, is underlying the uh, idea of rebellion and uh, rejection of all the conventions of, uh, of man's universe. And that's why this uh, movement is considered among the most uh, radical movements on many layers in uh, social, political, uh, literary, and philosophical layers. Uh, and the most rebellious character among these romantic poets or in romanticism is Lord Byron. His rebellion uh, stemmed from his temperament and his stormy life. He did not have a very calm life or stable life. His life was very unstable and her, the relation between his father and mother was very uh, was a very unstable relationship and that's why uh, uh, his character grew up in, uh, in uh, conditions which were not very healthy, I mean psychologically. Adding to this, his life was flavored with ill health. From his early childhood, he was very, uh, he's al he was always sick and he had, uh, he has a deformed uh, right leg and that's why he developed, psychologically speaking, he developed an irritable and volcanic character. He was always furious, he was always angry with his surroundings, whether with men or things. Lord Byron inherited, inherited some uh, uh, amount of wealth, which makes him uh, having, a, let's say, economically a very uh, comfortable uh, life. Um, uh, and also he had the title of Lord Byron at the uh, age of 10. So he is supposed to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, elevated socially. But, and he, but he was most notable uh, for his self-projected hero. He develops his, psycho his uh, character as a self-projected, self-critical hero. He published his first volume of verse, uh, Hours of Idleness, in 1809. And this volume of, uh, by the way, he, he published it, uh, he, and he was um, uh, about uh, 17 to 19 years old. So he was very young when he published this verse, uh, volume of verse. And this volume was attacked by the Edinburgh uh, Reviews. As a reaction, as we said, that Lord Byron is not a very quiet uh, person, so he reacted to these attacks in his poem, uh, in a very long poem, in a narrative poem, uh, entitled Bards and uh, Scotch uh, uh, Reviewers, or in fact English Bards and the Scotch uh, Reviewers, which was formed in a satirical heroic couplet. What is very important about this poem is that he attacked all the uh, literary men or men of letters of his time, even including William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Francis Jeffrey. Uh, and Francis Jeffrey is the editor of Edinburgh uh, Review. Why he rejected them, why he attacked them? Because they, consider, they were considered or they were celebrated by the society at that time and by the reviewers as the pioneers in romanticism. So he attacked them as part of his attack against this, uh, these uh, uh, harsh reviewers. Uh, and instead of uh, praising uh, Coleridge and, uh, and uh, William Wordsworth, he praised Pope and Dryden. So he uh, uh, emphasized the, uh, let's say, the literary genre of neoclassicism. Uh, then um, the, this poem, well, um, by the way, he was very young and he was very uh, 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 passionate in his reactions so that uh, he continued in uh, re-editing this uh, poem until he 
uh, suppressed the fifth edition in 1812 because he has he, he regretted his attitude uh, the writers as Coleridge and Wordsworth and he apologized, apologized for this for this from this uh, attitude we can infer that uh, Byron was a very irritable and furious character and this had caused him many problems. Now, as for, for Lord Byron's literary outcome, um, Byron um, is considered as the uh, um, elder uh, or eldest uh, uh, among the other romantics. He lived for 37 years, or approximately 37 years, and this uh, his uh, life was uh, uh, very rich in his literary outcome, because he uh, he already started writing from a very young age. Um, his uh, early uh, literary production, Child uh, Harold's Pilgrimage, immediately brought him an immense success because his style uh, that he presented was full of melancholy and meditations and contemplations on the instability of man's grandeur and power. Uh, first of all, he wrote two uh, parts of uh, Child Harold's uh, pilgrimage in 1812, and he continued until uh, 1818, where he re had written the last part, uh, uh, of course, in exile. Uh, this part, uh, this uh, part of uh, Child Harold's uh, pilgrimage, he wrote uh, during his stay in England. His work was the most varied among his contemporaries because it included satire, lyrics, narrative, and serious, serio-comic, regular tragedies, and dramatic poems. He was very, uh, uh, amongst the most vari uh, variable uh, 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 poet and writer who wrote uh, short stories. He wrote. Uh, 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 poetry and even in his poetry his uh, uh, poetry was not of one type it was uh, ranging between drama uh, dramatic uh, poems and dra tragedies and serious and comic satirical lyrical narrative so he was very varied on the uh, personal uh, life Byron married and got divorced uh, in 1816 within one year and this aroused people's contempt and hatred, accusing him of inequity. Uh, and by the very uh, and those uh, he was accused of this by the very people who loved him, who praised his works. And this matter led him to choose a self-exile in Italy. <coughs> and he traveled uh, and he stayed in different towns in Italy. And it is during this exile he uh, produced uh, the best of his work as uh, Manfred, Cain, and the third canto of Child Harold's pilgrimage. And uh, also he wrote his uh, Don Juan, was, which was unfinished because he died before uh, uh, finishing it. Uh, he threw himself into the, uh, <coughs> the Greek war for freedom uh, against the Turks. Uh, of course, he did not uh, die in, in battle, although he, he, he yearned and he longed to uh, die a heroic death, but he died out of fever in 1824. Uh, and uh, he died three months after he, he, he wrote this poem. Uh, on this day, I complete my 36th year. He wrote this poem in, on his 36th uh, birthday, as if it were, uh, or as if he presents a soliloquy or in which he contemplates his past life and he draws his, uh, let's say, um, uh, hope in the coming days. But it seems that he could not accomplish what he yearned in this poem to be a, a heroic figure because less than three months he died after uh, i mean after this uh, uh, writing this poem he died uh, within less than three months 
Byron was in Greece. Of course, he moved from uh, Italy to Greece, and he fought with the Greeks against their uh, uh, and their uh, uh, war against uh, the Ottoman Empire. They they were fighting for their independence. Um, and in this poem, you can see that it represents the poem represents one of more of Byron's most meditative and personal poems, and it remains one of his most popular and uh, most uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, one of his most uh, 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 famous poems. This poem is very important because uh, uh, the ways uh, Byron uses uh, um, many literary uh, devices as allusion, language, and imagery um, uh, were very marvelous, and he creates through this use of these ways uh, of literary uh, techniques, he creates a, a poem of defiance and pregnant lament, as if he is lamenting uh, his own um, type of life. He was lamenting or regretting the, the way of life he was living, and as if he, it anticipates his early death. The poem reflects the stages of Byron's uh, argument, and uh, also in this, po uh, in this poem, uh, in fact, not only in this poem, in many of his poems, in many of his works, uh, uh, Lord Byron uh, created a very important concept, which is the concept of the Byronic hero, and he he was followed. This this concept was followed by uh, uh, this concept. In fact, uh, was followed or was uh, copied by many of the writers, not only of of his time, nor uh, uh, but also during the modern time. Even not only in poetry, in many. Uh, genres of literature, like uh, what we will see in, for example, Bernard Shaw, who presents the Byronic hero, and many of the writers try to uh, develop this uh, concept to create the Byronic heroine, the female Byronic heroine. Dear ladies, concerning the Byronic hero, we have to know why did Byron uh, create such a, a hero, create such a character in his uh, literary outcome. In fact, from the beginning, we said that Byron was so much interested in the uh, earlier Enlightenment era tradition of Alexander Pope. And Pope was presenting uh, uh, types of characters or kinds of persons who are withering, comic, satirical, and emphatically uh, public. Um, uh, ba based on this, uh, Byron started to originate a whole a kind of uh, person uh, w which is called later as the Byronic hero, the hero who had been invented and created and developed by uh, uh, Byron in his work. Here, uh, this Byronic hero is usually uh, featured or characterized of a tormented figure. He is a tormented figure. He is not a stable figure. Uh, he is always ranging or torn between uh, the state of melancholy and uh, passion. Uh, he, it, he is idealistic and self-destructive. Uh, it means that he is always uh, self-destroying himself. Uh, and he is a figure, figure who is mostly described as a remorseful for unrepentant rebel, uh, rendered godlike. He is uh, uh, regretful uh, because he is always uh, rebelling, rebelling against uh, uh, matters, and this rebel cannot be repented, cannot be uh, forgiven. Uh, uh, but still. Uh, in his rebellion, he renders himself just like a god. He cannot retreat from this rebel. As if he, this, uh, this character is so much representative of Byron's own character. Now, to uh, define a Byronic hero, uh, we can say that he is a type of a fictional character who is a moody, brooding rebel. It means he is al always contemplating on his deeds, on, the, on his universe. He is contemplating, he is meditating. 
often one haunted by a dark secret from his past. This Byronic hero is always having some secret about him, whether it is from his past, whether it is related to his own character, there is some secret. The term Byronic hero describes the type of a main character found in many fictional works. As I said, uh, he was invented in not only in poetry, in many uh, works of Lord Byron, and he was followed, of course. And this, uh, this fictional character is always having such a type of personality. Uh, of course, he is a romantic hero, a young man fighting always fighting, always rebelling for lost causes. Uh, his causes, his reasons for having this uh, conflict with matters or with men is not always based on good, uh, let's say good or uh, decent causes. Because, and he is always, uh, he knows always that he is going to be, to be defeated. He is going to lose this, uh, uh, the battle of, in which he is fighting. Uh, the Byronic hero seems to be just like Byron. He is a very handsome man, noble, but still he is mysterious. As I said, he has some secret. Uh, what is that secret? It might be a horrible sin, it might be uh, some mistake, something which, is, which cannot be forgiven. Uh, but that character never, never says uh, or reveals his secret. And that's why, because he is always rebelling, he is considered as an outcast. He is, oh, he is abandoned by his society, and that's why he lives in solitary. He is uh, living in solitude, in isolation, uh, inaccessible. No one can reach his secret, and still he is a rebel. He is always, uh, uh, he always doesn't care for, uh, or he never cares for the conventions. Everyone can feel the presence of a shade in his past. We always feel that this character has something about his past, which causes him uh, this sense of melancholy, as if he is regretting something. And this, this secrecy about him makes him a very fascinating character. And that's why women are always running after him, like Don Juan, for example, like Keats, uh, sorry, like uh, Byron in his own uh, life. He had so many uh, 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 women relationships. While in his relationship with men, it, his, re his relations with men are very hazy. He never has good friendships with men or uh, or sometimes he is even uh, showing hostility uh, uh, against uh, or animosity with men. As it is mentioned before that this uh, poem, on this day I complete my 36th year, sixth year, uh, has been uh, or had been written uh, on his uh, 36th birth birthday. And uh, 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 from the uh, attitude and from the tone of the poem, uh, of the poet, in fact, or the speaker, we can uh, conceive and understand that uh, uh, Byron is not presenting a very hopeful uh, uh, poem. But he goes through stages. Of course, in this poem, he, the, law, the author, is going through uh, stages uh, of feeling, stages of his psyche. This poem is likely um, an autobiographical poem, and Lord Byron was uh, um, um, used to be, um, at his time, a, a heartbreaker of his day. He was very youthful, he was full of energy, and he was followed by uh, women, and he had so many love relationships, but uh, now, from the very beginning, it seems that all his worth as um, um, a loved person uh, is lost. And that's why he starts his uh, 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 poem with a sudden declaration. He declares that it's time this heart should be unmoved since other it has ceased to move. Uh, um, uh, 
The first line gives the reader a sense that the speaker feels he is moving into a new epoch. It is time this heart should be unmoved, so it is time to, to make some change to his heart. That it is time that this heart would never be moved by love relations. As if he is making a decision concerning changing, the, some change on the layer of love, on the idea of love. And uh, the speaker feels he's moving into a new epoch, into a new stage in his life. Something big is, is happening. Uh, concer now concerning his uh, uh, love, the idea of love, and even concerning uh, his own age. He says, yet though I cannot be loved, still let me love. He has some hope that although he is not uh, uh, loved, but still he has some energy in his love to be in his uh, sorry in his heart to present love to to some uh, uh, to somebody or something uh, he renounces being loved back but still he feels his heart is have is still having some power which is enough to beat with love uh, 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 and in stanza two he continues this attitude by uh, referring to his age now first of all he, he declares something about the idea of love concerning his heart concerning himself as being <clears throat> as being no more loved or be, be loved by others now he talks about his age he says that uh, uh, he feels as if his uh, energy is fading, his, his uh, uh, youth is fading, just like an autumn leaf. By the way, he is 36. In, in our modern time, we may not look at a person or, with his age of 36 as an old person, but at his time, and with his Ill, Ill health, he feels that he is decaying, that his age is so... Uh, uh, is so old <clears throat> and he is now in the epoch of life in which his leaves get uh, yellow just like a tree <clears throat> he he says that the seasons of youth are ending and the progression of death of age is represented through the loss of these leaves or of flowers and fruits as if he were a tree that lo no longer produces any fruit or flowers it becomes clear to the uh, hearer or to the reader that the speaker does not see himself as having much left at all. He says that only what is mine is the worm, the canker, and the grief. He says that uh, um, uh, the only thing that accompanies him are things which are signs of decay and old age. His company is made up of worms, of grief, as well as the canker, a reference to a disease of uh, a fruit tree uh, of uh, of fruits and the trees, and uh, this disease uh, uh, is eating the fruits and the trees from inside. So he is eating from inside. He knows that something that is consuming him from inside, and usually this inside consumption is a psychological one. Now, in, uh, in stanza three, when uh, after he uh, uh, refers to himself as uh, just like a tree uh, uh, with falling leaves and giving no fruits and eating from inside, he again uh, goes to uh, his own self, uh, talking about the fire uh, that he used to have in his uh, youthful uh, uh, days. In this stanza, uh, um, he again thinks of himself as being unable to be loved and as lonely and isolated. He says, as lone as some volcanic uh, isle, no torch is kindled as it is uh, blaze a funeral pile. In this third stanza, uh, uh, he ded dedicates his uh, pres uh, description to show how much alone he is and how much unloved and uncared for he is and uh, yet he he says although he feels this loneliness but uh, there is some 
uh, he refers to himself just like a volcano, a volcanic isol, the isol uh, uh, under which or beneath which there is a huge fire that is uh, 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 waiting to be uh, um, uh, torched or to be lit. But this fire is unseen. And this fire used to be uh, inside him because it is the fire that he used to have in his relations, the fire of energy, the fire of passion that he previously filled his relationships. It, uh, he says that it is still there. It, it was not um, all extinguished. But because he is lonely, this fire is not uh, referred to as a torch to kindle for others. Instead, it burns within him. It, uh, it is burning him from inside. It is consuming him, leaving uh, uh, or leading him to his funeral. It is just like a funeral pile. Uh, it is more a funeral pile than a force that is driving uh, or that, uh, that is similar to the fire that used to drive his uh, passions during his youth uh, or youthful days. In this depressed uh, state, he says that uh, the love, or he describes that the love he used to nourish in his oppressed, uh, breast uh, is now consuming him. The speaker here, the, 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 the speaker, who is, of course, the author himself, reveals that by re-evaluating oneself, by looking back to oneself, by trying to uh, uh, search, uh, by, by trying to search for your value, for your worth, uh, uh, somebody will uh, 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 reignite uh, uh, the soul's fire. Somebody will uh, uh, look back to this fire and reevaluate this fire. He is like the volcanic isol. All the fire, the passions are imprisoned in his person, uh, but uh, it can no longer find an expression uh, uh, outside himself because he is no more cared for by others, he is lonely. In the fourth stanza, now he, uh, after he talks about the fire which used to light his, uh, his love relationships, now he talks about the type of, re, uh, of uh, or he talks about love itself uh, and what type of an experienced love is. He says that uh, in, in love, there are complexities, there are pains, there are uh, equal pay parts of pain and the pleasure. It is not all pain and it is not all pleasure. L he says that love brings with it jealousy. These are all signs of love. Jealousy, hope, fear, and care. And uh, these are uh, the things that he used to relish uh, during, during his youth. But now, he cannot share these uh, signs of love because he is alone. He, 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 because he is alone, these pleasures and pains altogether are only uh, uh, constituting a chain around his neck because he cannot uh, share them with others. And uh, they, they are burdening him, they are tolerating him because they are giving more weight to his melancholy. His passion has become uh, just like a burden than a joy. Love is presented in the first and second lines as exalted with the complex co contradictory nouns of care, hope, fear, and pain. But in the last line, um, uh, the reference to love is very negative when he says, but we are the chain. Because and power of love I cannot share because he cannot share these powers of love whether painful or pleasurable uh, portions uh, uh, love turned to be or his passion turned to be just like a chain surrounding his neck so he refers to love as something negative because the chain is a sign of imprisonment as if he's, uh, he, uh, he was unable to truly realize the pure emotion. The pure emotion of love, uh, which is away from passion, which is away from desire, uh, 
was not one of the uh, experiences uh, the, the, the poet or the author had experienced. In fact, all the love that he, uh, he had gone through in, uh, in his youth was all away from uh, pure emotion. It, is ba it was based only on, let's say, desires, on passions, but they are not pure emotions. And that's why they turned to be, uh, in his uh, old age, they turned to be just like a chain. They turned to be a burden for him. Had he uh, experienced the real love, the real pure emotion, he would never refer to it as a chain uh, surrounding his neck. As if he is regretting that he had gone uh, through such type of love during his youth. Uh, dear ladies, uh, in the uh, first four stanzas, um, uh, the, uh, the poet or the author is presenting the first uh, part of the poem in which he laments his uh, lot, in which he feels uh, sorry for himself. But in this stanza, in stanza five, he turns to another uh, uh, aspect which represents the second half of the poem. In this half, in this part, uh, uh, the, uh, the author decides not to uh, feel sorry for her, himself or, for, or uh, lament his uh, lot or uh, uh, <coughs> regret what has been in the past. Uh, now he decides to, tur to take a turn in his uh, attitude in, and in his tone uh, because he is now, uh, by the way, he, when he wrote this uh, poem, he was uh, still in Greece. So he remembers that he is uh, still in this uh, place which is representing for, uh, representing for him and for the Western world, it represents a, a symbol and uh, an example of glory. So he says, it is not here, I am supposed to uh, cry for my destiny, it is not in this way I have to, say, uh, to talk about myself. Why? Because the place is a place of glory. I have to, uh, he, he, he shakes his thoughts and he, uh, he tries to give up these ne negative uh, thoughts. Uh, and by, by this decision he shakes in fact his own soul. Uh, uh, he he chooses to uh, uh, to uh, remember or to uh, emphasize thoughts that shake his soul uh, 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 in such a way that it supports uh, his soul. So rather become a sacrifice to his useless love, he is going to fight on. He decides to continue his battle in life. And he continues his uh, um, uh, uh, struggle with life. Instead of sacrificing, or uh, to to be, uh, instead of becoming a sacrifice to this lamentation of his useless love. So he says that I'm not going to be just like a hero's buyer. The buyer, the hero's buyer, is the platform on which uh, the coffin of a dead uh, soldier is put and uh, carried. So in this stanza he remembers that he is um, in Greece and he says that he could, shouldn't think pessimistically in this land of heroism, in this land of heroes and chivalry and bravery. The speaker moves on uh, in this military challenge as if he is doing his own battle. Um, uh, in fact, he in, in in fact in reality he had moved himself to Greece in order to uh, be part of this military cha challenge, supporting the Greek nation in their rebellion against uh, the Turkish rule. Uh, uh, um, I mean, struggling or rebelling to gain their freedom. So the battle is another metaphor for freedom. War, often misguidedly described as glorious, has evidently captivated by, he was captivated uh, by this idea, uh, because he is, of course, war is never glorious, but usually who goes with, to war with certain, uh, uh, let's say, just and great purpose, he looks at war as glorious. So uh, he describes it as glory, pure glory. 
as he looks at it. He wants to say that death in battle creates glorious heroes. So here, this this uh, uh, reference to uh, 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 war as a glory makes him accept the idea of death as far as death is the, is uh, or happens due to great uh, causes. So he continues in the sixth stanza or in this attitude that he is glorifying war, that he is accepting death because uh, the, the such type of death will be uh, for a just purpose or such, uh, just uh, cause. So he continues this militaristic uh, imagery. This is the image of uh, of the uh, of war uh, and military. He refers to the elements of the battle, the sword, the banner, and the, the field. All these elements <coughs> uh, are uh, con constituting the militaristic uh, image, imagery. And he, um, in fact, uh, this battle on, on the field is the same, uh, is a metaphor to the battle in his own mentality, in his own mind. So these elements of the battle, they make up his own mental image of the task that he turned his mind to, which task that he, he must make uh, his own struggle something glorious, and he accepts death as something uh, 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 glorious also, uh, as far as it, cre uh, it uh, 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 guarantees his heroism, his glory. <clears throat> Uh, there are swords and banners and the field and the glory, wa uh, uh, all the glory that somebody would want. He also speaks of Greece as a location for the metaphorical battle for the recovery of his purpose. Now, um, um, he, he considers that Greece, just like the soldier finds in the field of the battle, his uh, um, important cause, uh, 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 Lord Byron had found in, or ha had found it in this field of Greece as a location for his own battle against death, against illness, against the miseries of life. So it, uh, Greece became the field of his own mental battle. So here we say that uh, uh, the metaphor of the battle here uh, in fact, the battle is a metaphor for his own uh, uh, mental and uh, spiritual and psychological battle. What is the field of that mental uh, battle? It is Greece. It is the place that he uh, exiled himself uh, to. Because he wants to make for himself some other purpose that he was living uh, his, all his life for. His, uh, his past purpose was not a very uh, heroic purpose. Now he chose Greece to be his own heroic purpose, or to change his uh, purpose to be heroic. In fact, Greece was a favorite uh, place or location for all the Romantics, uh, because uh, it represented the land, um, uh, an exotic land, a faraway land where purposes where uh, purposes of heroism of chivalry of uh, morality can be gained the speaker tries to represent his own elusive here uh, uh, glory here uh, in this Greece he can ch he can uh, make his own uh, glory but this glory of course it is elusive because it is done through a battle So if one asks why he tries to create his, uh, he, he wants uh, this battle to be created in his mind, because he, he finds that through this battle, it is only the, through the battle uh, the soldier can free himself. Just like, uh, because he, he believed that this <coughs> battle against the Turkish rule were, or was uh, done by the Greek uh, uh, people, um, in order to free themselves from uh, tyranny. And he would like to be like the Spartans. The Spartans are the Greek people, the ancient Greek people, uh, who were living in, uh, in uh, Sparta, 
the prominent city-state in ancient Greece. He sees, he looks at them as uh, he looks at the Spartans as being uh, free, and they 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 uh, but they uh, go to the field to free themselves to liberate themselves from all the chains of their rulers. For the speaker, uh, speaker, this battle will represent freedom, of course, his own freedom. Now, dear ladies, after he, he uh, refers to Greece as the uh, place where he should shake his soul, now he continues uh, uh, announcing or, uh, let's say, uh, uh, addressing his own soul to wake up. He says, awake, not to Greece. She is awake. He, he refers to Greek as being a place where people or where souls are awakened and they are, they are, the spirits are shaken to great causes. So he begins with an exclamatory uh, word, awake. He, he is uh, addressing his own uh, soul to awake and to give up its numbing, its sleeping, uh, uh, which, which it used uh, to uh, be in. So he repeats the word awake, awake in the same line, and then he, uh, he uh, repeats it in the second line. And this technique is known as anaphora. Uh, this technique is used to draw more attention, additional attention to the word because he is emphasizing this state of being awakened. Byron begins this line by asking uh, uh, someone, of course not Greece, to wake up. Who is that someone? It is his uh, soul. He is speaking to his own soul, which used to be sleeping and uh, numbing, enjoying its happiness and enjoying its love relationships. So he wants to awaken his own soul from too much sleeping in that uh, physical joy and that uh, mortal joy so uh, he he addresses it as saying as if he is saying that it is now the time for his soul to rise up away from its blood life of blood life of blood it means a reference to his passions to physical passions and this uh, passionate uh, past which he used to uh, spend his life in and then he says uh, uh, you have to uh, get away from this life of blood and you have to go to your uh, parent lake. Parent lake, it means uh, its uh, original source, its original source, its uh, original purpose. And he says, strike home. You have to leave this life of blood and you strike home. Byron uh, repeats also in the second, this second line, uh, 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 um, let's say um, um, he seems to uh, be delivering uh, an arousing uh, battle speech. We said that he is wa he wants to make his own mental battle. So as if he is talking to his soldiers. Who are his soldiers? His soul, his own uh, uh, spirit, and uh, his own passions. He is delivering as if he is delivering a speech before launching this battle, just like a commander or a leader who gives a pre-battle speech to, uh, to uh, support his uh, uh, soldiers with, with the spiritual strength, with psychological uh, strength. Now, uh, as I said, that life of blood is a reference to uh, his own passions because life, blood, it is the source of his passions. Now he wants uh, this life of blood or his passions to be uh, uh, soldiers to his own new task, the spiritual and psychological task that he wants to make uh, in his soul. Um, uh, here, as I said, the parent lake is maybe uh, it is uh, the reference to his heart or its original source, which is his own real entity. The parent lake is the real entity from which the spirit, uh, the soul, are flourishing. And he continues in stanza 8 by, uh, by, by trying to encourage his uh, soul. 
and encourage his own spirit, his soldiers, I mean, his soldiers, his mental soldiers, his metaphorical soldiers. Um, you have to know that all these, instead of the elements of the sword, of the uh, field, uh, he is now, he, may, he is making the elements of his battle, uh, uh, or the elements of the mental battle as his soul, and he tries to encourage them by this pre uh, 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 pre uh, battle speech. <clears throat> Yes. Now, as if as if his his passions are trying to discourage him from this purpose. Now he he says what? As if he is talking to the enemy. Who are his enemies? Are the reviving passions? He he urges himself to suppress this enemy, to suppress the reviving passions that go back to him, because as if his. His, his body wants him to be uh, to continue its uh, pleasurable, uh, pleasurable life so he wants to revive uh, sorry to suppress these reviving passions as if these old passions try to, to discourage him from pursuing his newborn uh, determination the psychological determination spiritual uh, determination when he feels that he is hesitant when he feels that his passions are, or uh, the past passions are trying to revive themselves, he, he, he feels hesitant. And when he feels hesitant, he asks his soul to repress any reviving passions. Such passions should be kept down and away from his mind and heart in order to continue uh, this uh, mental pat battle, in order to continue to, to achieve glory. He wants to hush these reviving passions down. Through this appeal for his soul to repress the passions, it seems as if he is regretting the way he lived uh, in the past uh, uh, when he spent his life in uh, pleasures and in, uh, in uh, physical enjoyment uh, until this point. It is because it has led, uh, maybe he, he regrets this, uh, this type of life because it is the cause that led him to this desperate position, a position that led him to go to Greece and uh, search another type of life. He feels like he has lived in an unworthy life. He refers to his uh, uh, past life as being unworthy. And the speaker continues, uh, this is the speaker, continues to address his own soul talking to his soul, encouraging his soul. This time he says that his resolution should be strong enough to resist the smile or frown of beauty. Of course here beauty, just like glory, love, uh, are uh, capitalized maybe to emphasize the, uh, the effect of these matters uh, 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 on his life. Uh, he, or maybe beauty is a reference to his passions, to his uh, 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 um, uh, 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 sensuous uh, pleasure that may dampen his own resolution. <clears throat> the, all these agents, beauty, glory, love, in the past used to be, or, or uh, are presented in, in the uh, poem as if they are characters, as if they are uh, uh, anonymous uh, or um, um, dynamic uh, actors uh, who use to influence uh, the speaker's life. And as I said, beauty may refer to the sensual pleasures. Now, now, when he refers to, to the uh, unworthy manhood or unworthy uh, 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 life, of course, unworthy manhood means unworthy life, uh, as we said, it suggests that he feels guilty or a recognition that the poet um, uh, regrets that um, uh, recognition that he, he would have used his time better than uh, that he used it in the past. 
ladies, in this part of the poem, the last uh, two stanzas, uh, now the speaker reaches a conclusion that for men it is either to live life properly or to give up living altogether. But even in giving up living altogether, he must find a good cause for, uh, uh, for this uh, end of his life. Uh, in, in these lines, uh, which start with the uh, question, uh, are quite dramatic and allude to death. Uh, they are referring to death as the only option for someone who has lived uh, his life uh, unworthily. When he asks himself what it means to regret one's youth, he suggests that the only thing someone uh, who is like the speaker can do is to fight and to, uh, to find his own uh, battle to attempt uh, some, some, uh, something that regains uh, uh, one's self glory that regains the glory that he feels about himself uh, so he directs his soul and anyone reading, uh, reading his uh, words who might feel the same thing who might feel that his worth, uh, his life is unworthy, he directs uh, him and his soul to go uh, to the field and give away thy breath, to go to the field to search his death, but for great causes. This rhetorical question in the first line is saying in effect that he regrets uh, the way he has lived, so he might as well die, but when he dies let his death be for a good purpose for an honorable uh, cause not in vain let his death uh, happen not in vain just like his life which was uh, wasted in vain uh, when he says honorable uh, death on the battlefield um, uh, he he suggests that uh, the man he is talking about himself or the man who is reading the, these lines uh, is a man who is reckless who is uh, who has spent his life uh, uh, in vain so uh, he must such a man must erase all his past he must erase and delete all his past because it is not worthy because it is not honorable and make some amendment by ending his life for a good purpose through fighting fighting for an honorable uh, purpose or cause when he refers to the field as capitalized, again, it is an important agent uh, in, in, uh, in directing his life, but not the uh, former life as beauty or love. Uh, but, uh, uh, now the field is an agent that must direct his life, his new life, the second phase of his life, which is towards his death. And this uh, word field is representing uh, uh, any battleground fought for a just cause. In fact, again, this is a reference to the metaphorical field of the battle, of the mental, psychological, spiritual battle that the writer or the speaker wants to uh, launch. In stanza 10, uh, he continues on uh, uh, emphasizing the idea that unless you die for a good, uh, you, uh, unless your life is uh, spent for a good purpose, uh, uh, so you are not worthy of life, of, of living. So you have to end your life at least for a good purpose. So in the f last uh, four lines of the poem, the speaker returns to the solemn tone, the, the melancholy tone uh, uh, with which uh, he began his poem. Now, uh, uh, in this point at which he has decided death as the only option available to a person who lost his uh, worth, who, who spent his uh, life unworthily, uh, when he reaches this uh, conclusion, uh, he asks himself to seek out a soldier's grave, a death which is similar to a soldier's death, a death that, uh, that, ex that is glorious. So once he chooses such uh, an option to end his life, 
he needs to look around he says that I need to look around and choose my own ground my own grave to be buried in this is his destiny to finally find rest and repent for the way he has lived on, up until now so he, he, he finds that the only rest he can find is by finding a soldier's grave for himself so he is now according himself or he is now uh, announcing himself as a soldier not a, an ordinary person anymore the conclusion is also uh, an, uh, um, uh, a deep conclusion a thorough and melancholy conclusion he is seeking his own death regarding the soldier's grave as a way to resolve his sense of waste in in conclusion or in effect it is his way of repaying repaying his debt to society because he did not he considers that he did not <coughs> do his real so uh, uh, role uh, towards society so by fighting for the society by being a soldier, by gra uh, gaining glory, he is going to repay his debt to his society. For the speaker, his reckless solution will bring him rest. The speaker uh, is going to take a hard look at himself uh, because he regrets his uh, youth and he tries to find a way to this gloriously uh, or to, to gloriously end his life just like a soldier now the battle the mental battle the metaphorical battle that he chooses is a battle for a great cause and because it is a battle for a great cause he chooses to die just like a soldier to find himself a grave which is similar to uh, a soldier's grave now, as we finished uh, uh, explaining the poem uh, stanza by stanza, now we, we, we will make some conclusion of the themes and literary uh, devices uh, in the poem. In fact, there are so many uh, themes and there, uh, there is a diversity of literary uh, devices in the poem, but we are, uh, I'm, I'm going to present you the most prominent ones uh, referring to um, or um, mainly uh, referred to in the poem starting with the first uh, uh, theme uh, as he starts the i mean the speaker starts the uh, poem uh, we have love versus aging uh, here uh, the poem poet starts from the very beginning uh, with the discussion of the idea of love whether uh, 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 um, or in, in fact it is the main interest of the uh, poet or the speaker that uh, uh, love is no more available for him uh, he is no more beloved he is no more cared for but still he emphasizes with of course love is usually coming with a uh, young age but when he is aging now he is matured now he uh, 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 his maturity gives him the idea that he is no more able to be loved by others because he's aging he's no more youth uh, uh, youthful okay so uh, yet he emphasizes that with this aging he still wants to feel love he wants his heart to feel love okay so his act, he accepts uh, all these uh, pains of love. He says that uh, with love there are pains and all these things, but still he accepts to feel the pains of love, um, uh, even if he is unable to, fa uh, to, to enjoy the pleasures of love. And now he, he, uh, he sacrifices these uh, pleasures. He only wants that his, li his, uh, his life and his uh, heart beats uh, with love. Now the second uh, uh, or another uh, uh, theme which is very important is that with this aging, 
uh, uh, the the speaker starts to, or with this maturity, uh, the speaker starts to revive the spark of change. As, as far as he is no not able, he's unable uh, to make a, a change uh, in what he has lost in his past. He is creating a potential inside him for changing. Uh, uh, his position, his desperate position. So it is only man. Uh, I mean, uh, change cannot uh, uh, cannot come unless man creates a potential to make this change. So uh, the decision made by the speaker uh, uh, as not to feel sorry for his uh, uh, for his past and not to lament his lot and resist his elusive passions is the inner power that helps him regain the worth of his life and uh, regain some sense of uh, achievement and some sense of glory. Another uh, 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 theme is glory and sacrifice. As the poem's speaker, uh, I mean, as this uh, uh, poem reaches, uh, uh, or uh, as the speaker in the poem reaches the middle age, and turns away from love, he seeks out a new ideal, the glorious death. Instead, uh, he sacrifices, he, he is, um, let's say, he is apt and ready to sacrifice his own physical life uh, for the sake of what? For the sake of gaining uh, glory. And that's why he starts to create his own uh, metaphorical uh, battle, and uh, he... He, he wants to take the position of a Greek uh, soldier. Uh, in fact, in, in reality, the author himself has sacrificed his soul, his uh, life, and he gave up all his pleasurable life, and he traveled to Greece in order to join the battles of Greece for freedom. In order, he, he feels that by having a good cause in his life, he would uh, uh, gain glory. And he would have the opportunity to to be become an undying part of history. So through death, he will be an undying part of history. The, this is the these are the most uh, important, let's say, uh, themes discussed in the poem, or at least the themes that uh, uh, sum up uh, the poem. Now, moving to the literary devices, ladies, we have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, literary devices used in this uh, poem. In fact, as we have already mentioned, that uh, uh, Lord Byron is the most diversive or diversive uh, 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 poem. Uh, or poet, sorry, uh, among the Romantics. He is the most varied uh, poet in his uh, uh, choice of, uh, or in his uh, styles uh, and uh, uh, poems, and in his use of literary devices. He uses in this uh, uh, poem, he uses imagery, he uses symbolism, he uses metaphors, and all these things. Uh, are included in his poem, and more than these things, of course, but I'm going to present you with the most prominent uh, uh, literary devices he uses in the poem. Uh, uh, imagery is the most uh, important uh, technique used. He uses uh, images uh, which refer to themes of glory and heroism, uh, especially uh, uh, I mean, um, also he has in, in uh, a reference to manhood, uh, soldier's grave, uh, honorable death, uh, the images of the battle, or the elements of the battle. He uses all these images to t to uh, depict the change in his behavior and the desire, his desire to end his life as a man worthy of. Uh, 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 having a life uh, which worthy of having a life just like uh, the soldier's life. In fact, images are diverse in this uh, poem, uh, and you can uh, go through the poem and uh, uh, 
um, find each image uh, by itself and explain or uh, comment on these images. Now, concerning symbolism, we have uh, many symbols as the autumn, when he refers to himself uh, 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 just like the tree. Of course, the symbolism here can, uh, constitutes many, many metaphors, in fact. The, um, uh, by the way, uh, uh, when you look at the poem, you will find the, the devices are interlapping. How? For example, in imagery, he uses the image of the battle, but within this image, uh, there are many metaphorical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, elements. In symbolism, you have also uh, 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 symbols, but within these symbols, you have uh, metaphors. For example, when he compares himself to the tree, the tree is a metaphor for the speaker, but it includes uh, the whole. The whole matter is symbolic because it is a reference to autumn. Also, we have the fire. The fire, when we said, when, we, when he says that uh, I am still having this fire, the fire is uh, a symbol for uh, for love, for energy, for passions. But uh, at the same time, the fire is uh, di is directed to another meaning, uh, which is uh, a, a negative meaning. When he refers to fire as the funeral pile. Um, also, he goes uh, to use the symbol of chain, uh, chains. When he refers to love at first, he says that uh, 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 love is uh, having so many exalted pleasures, uh, beautiful pleasures that, uh, uh, <coughs> that he can uh, feel its uh, ecstasy. But but at the same time, the chain here uh, is going to be a reference to many, maybe for the Greeks, for the Greek people, it is just like the chain of political oppression. And for him, the chains are a reference to his own passions that made him feel love and the pleasures of love. And now they are just like a burden to him. Uh, 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 which he, which he, when he feels the, their burden, he decides to change his uh, uh, latter life. His former life was spent with these chains, but he did not feel them as chains. Now they are a burden, and these burden, uh, burdens or these chains uh, are what urged him, what drived him to make uh, the change at the end of his life.